Your next reading is Portfolio Risk and Return Part 2 and uh, these are the specific learning outcome statements. The first value says describe the implication of combining a risk-free asset with a portfolio of risky assets. So that is exactly what we did in the previous reading, Portfolio Risk and Return Part 1. What it all involved, when we combine a portfolio of risky assets with a risk-free asset, we can improve the return risk characteristic of the portfolio, resulting in a better trade-off. That's what we discussed in our previous reading. So the combination of uh, risky assets with the risk-free rate results in what we call the capital allocation line. We discussed it de in detail in the previous reading. And how the investor would allocate his assets, the proportion of allocation to the risky assets versus the proportion of allocation to the risk-free asset, it will be entirely dependent on the risk preferences of the investor. Uh, then what about the expected return of the portfolio, the composite portfolio that contains the risky assets and the risk-free asset? We will discuss it through an equation in the subsequent uh, LOSs. So let us move on. The next LOS says, explain the capital allocation line and the capital market line. Now, this is your capital allocation line we discussed in your previous reading portfolio risk and return part one so what it shows it shows the combination of risk-free assets this here and risky asset the risky asset basically is is the portfolio available to the investor multiple portfolios available to the investor so this line we discussed in the previous reading is what you call the capital allocation line and we discussed how it was derived so now let's see what about the capital market line so capital market line basically it is a special case of capital allocation line how does it make it different from the capital allocation line the difference between the capital allocation line and the capital market line is that for capital allocation line it is made up of allocation between the risk free asset and a risky portfolio for an investor whereas in capital market line the risk portfolio is the market portfolio. That's the difference. The investor defines the market to be its domestic stock index. That is a collection of all the uh, stocks in that particular market. And the expected return of the market is expressed as the expected return of that index. Let me show you here. Uh, from our previous reading, we would know that uh, the risk return characteristic for the potential risky asset portfolio, it can be plotted to generate a Markowitz efficient frontier as you can see here. So the point where the risk-free asset touches or is a tangent to this Mark Markowitz portfolio, this is what gives you the market portfolio and the market portfolio. And the line that you see here, the line that connects the risk-free asset with this market portfolio is the capital market line okay how about calculating the return for capital market line okay as you can see let's say if we have a weight one of our investment invested in a risk-free asset and the corresponding one minus weight one would be the investment in the risky asset generating this return ERM now we know that uh, the portfolio variance of two assets is calculated by using this formula. Weight 1, variance, weight 2 squared, variance plus 2 times weight 1, weight 2, the coefficient of correlation and standard deviation for asset 1 and standard deviation for asset 2. Since we know that the risk for risk-free asset is 0, right? So that would mean that this factor will become 0. Here the standard deviation that is representing the risk of risk-free asset and here same the variance for risk so they these these two terms will become then this one and this so what you will have in the end you will just have the standard that's the variance weight two squared and the variance of the risky asset now 
if you take the if you take the square root that will become the standard deviation of the portfolio and we have just represented the weight 2 as 1 minus w1 so it's going to be 1 minus w1 squared now becomes simple value and this variance is now simply the market portfolio uh, that is the standard deviation of the the market portfolio now let us draw the cml equation this is the equation of a line linear equation y is equal to a plus bx let us draw this now our a represents the y intercept which in this case is rf okay and on the x axis we have the standard deviation of the portfolio so this would represent your x on the y we have expected portfolio return fine now this is what we want to find out the gradient of the cml line for gradient you need to have two points the first point has a 0x and rf as y and the second point has a standard deviation market portfolio and rm as y so if you apply the formula for calculating the gradient that is y2 minus y1 y1 here is rf upon x2 minus x1 so x1 here x2 here is standard deviation market portfolio and x1 is 0 so what you get is the expected return the market minus risk free rate upon the variance of the market portfolio standard deviation market portfolio so this is what has been replaced in place of b so this is now the equation the capital market line equation rf this is the beta or what you call the slope of the uh, capital market line and then this represents x so your equation now can be written this way rf plus standard deviation of market portfolio erm minus rf this is the one okay now what is the implication now an investor who chooses to take no risk he will uh, earn the risk free rate right and the investor who is willing to take on risk he will earn an additional return called the market risk premium okay now if we assume that investor can both lend at the risk free rate and borrow at the risk free rate so they can select portfolios to the right of the market portfolio like here the entire investment is the, in the risk free asset here 50 percent in risk free asset 50 percent in the market asset is 75 percent in market and then 100 percent in the market so this part of the capital market line this these portfolios here they they are the lending portfolios and uh, to the right of the capital market line beyond m these are the borrowing portfolio as i just said that uh, the investors can both lend or uh, borrow at risk free rate and they can select the portfolios to the right and left of the capital market line so those investors who believe that the prices are informationally efficient they will simply follow the passive investment strategy we discussed in our previous readings so that is just invest in an index of risky assets that serve as a proxy or otherwise the investor will follow the active portfolio management strategy if he believes that the prices are uh, not informationally efficient the next LOS says explain systematic and non-systematic risk including why an investor should not expect to receive additional return for bearing non-systematic risk first of all systematic risk as we discussed earlier in the previous reading it's it's a non-diversifiable market risk it cannot be avoided like we cannot in in avoid inflation we cannot avoid interest rate risk we cannot avoid of course there are ways to do it but but this is something that everyone faces inflation interest rate uh, business or economic cycle every business every firm is affected by these risks that's why it's called the risk of the system and that's why we call it systematic risk when we say non-systematic risk or specific risk these are asset specific risk risk specific to a unique investment unique company where you're investing uh, this is something that can be this is n basically can be diversified away uh, like industrial actions discovery of major 
uh, oil and gas reserves, so on and so forth. So, here is an important point to make. The investors are only compensated for, for bearing systematic risk. There is no compensation for, for non-systematic or specific risks. The reason, this is also called the diversifiable risk. Now, let us imagine if there is some compensation uh, for diversifiable risk. Let us say this is a particular asset and there is some compensation for taking on the risk of investing in this asset. So, the demand for this asset and such diversifiable assets, it will keep on increasing, pushing the prices to infinity and return to zero. So, that is the reason there is no compensation for non-systematic or diversifiable risk. Next, next LO says explain return generating models including the market models and their uses. A return generating model basically is uh, one that can uh, provide investors with an estimate of the return that he can earn from a particular security given certain input parameters. So, there are two models, multi-factor model and then single index model. When we say multi-factor model, this model uses various factors, macroeconomic fundamental factors, statistical factors, inflation, interest rate, taxes, business confidence. It's, so, these, these factors are correlated with the returns of the security. For example, let us say, if there is high GDP growth rate, that this will positively affect the returns on this investment. Consumer confidence, if there is high consumer confidence, there will be, uh, of course, high returns, mm, earnings growth, firm size, there are many factors. So, so it is more or less like uh, a multiple regression model that we have studied in, in our statistics in the undergraduate course. That is y is equal to a plus b1 x1 plus b2 x2 plus b3 x3 and so on b and xn. But in this context, it is going to be the expected return, risk free rate and then of course, various factors with their coefficients. So, as you can see, this model states that the expected excess return. Now, what is excess return? There is ER minus RF. So, if you just take RF to this side, so that would be the excess return. That is the return above the risk free rate. So, the excess return for a certain asset is the sum of each factor sensitivity. This beta 1 represents the factor sensitivity, also called the factor loading, multiplied by the expected value of that factor for the period plus beta 2 plus expected value of that factor for the period. So, adding these all up will give you the expected excess return. That is your multi-factor model. Next, we have single index model. Single index model basically, uh, it is a, it's a single factor linear model that uses the market factor as the only factor. So, this model basically is driven from the capital market line. The model equation is actually a rewrite of the capital market line. So, your expected return on portfolio becomes the expected return on the asset. RF to the other side, that will give you the excess return is equal to the volatility of the return on the asset upon the volatility of the market portfolio and rest is this part. Numerator is the same. And this is right here is what you call the factor weight or loading and it, it shows the ratio of the security risk to the market risk. Okay, now here we go. Now, this is the direct replication of a single index model in the market model. So, here Ri stands for the return on the asset. This basically is alpha, alpha i. Alpha i is the intercept, y intercept of course. Uh, beta i is the slope coefficient. RM is the market return and EI here represents the abnormal return on the asset. Uh, abnormal return here means the return above its expected return. Okay, your next LO says calculate and interpret beta. What is beta? Beta basically it is the 
sensitivity of an asset's return to the return of the market. Beta basically is is to measure the risk of the system or it's it captures systematic risk. It can have positive value, it can have negative. When when we say beta is positive, it means return of an asset move with the market, up or down. When we say the beta is negative, that means the return of an asset they move opposite to the market. If the market goes up, the returns fall for this asset and vice versa. How do we calculate beta? Beta is correlation of asset to the market times the risk of the asset here given by standard deviation upon the risk of the market. We just need to plug in the numbers and we will get our value. So just there are some important points to discuss. If the beta is greater than 1, absolute value, it means it is more responsive. I'm not talking about negative or positive, just the absolute value. If it is greater than 1, it means then it is more volatile than the changes in the market. It will react more than the changes in the market. Let's say if it's positive, if the market goes up and the beta is greater than 1, that asset will show higher return and vice versa. Conversely speaking, if the beta is less than 1, then the asset will be less volatile, it will be less reactive than the changes in the market. So you can just interpret this way, if the market goes up, it will move up slightly and if it falls, and when the beta is exactly equal to 1, it means then they move up and down in the same way. That is, they respond in the same way. Okay, now let's just do some basic maths for beta. Let's take three cases. Case 1. Given that the risk of the market is 20%, What is the beta of a 10 million treasury bill? The beta would be zero because it is risk free. Case two. An asset has a standard deviation of 15% uh, and the market correlation of zero. What is the value of beta? course beta would be zero as per the formula we discussed in the previous slide and in the third case what is the beta of an asset with the standard deviation of 15% uh, and a market correlation of 0.8 given that the market standard deviation is 10% uh, what would be the beta? We know the formula in the previous slide. Let me show you this one. So, beta is going to be the coefficient of correlation of the asset to the market. That is 0.8 times 15% upon 10%. So, if you simplify, it's going to be 1.2. So, this is greater than 1, which means it will be more responsive to the changes in the returns on the market. So, that ends your LOS calculate and interpret beta. Next, we have explain the capital asset pricing model, including its assumption and the security market line. What is capital asset pricing model all about? CAPM is a model to ascertain expected return of a security or an asset. The, the primary determinant in the capital asset pricing model is the beta. Beta as a capture of systematic risk. And this would be the equation that we will use in CAPM. Expected return on the asset, risk-free rate, beta as discussed in the previous uh, LOS, and the excess return, the premium that is the expected return on the market minus risk-free rate. There are certain assumptions to this model. First, investors are risk averse. They are rational and they are utility maximizing. We discussed this concept in the previous reading. What is utility maximizing? Uh, the investor wants high returns. 
every investor wants higher returns. And then what does it mean by being rational? Rational means every investor analyzes available information correctly to arrive at rational decisions. Second assumption is that markets are frictionless, including no transaction costs and no taxes. Of course, it's a debatable assumption. How can it be? There are always invariably some transaction costs. Taxes, you can't avoid taxes. Deaths and taxes can't be avoided. They are inevitable things. So markets are frictionless, including no transaction costs and no taxes. When we say frictionless, means unlimited short selling as well as unlimited borrowing at risk-free rate, which is again a questionable assumption, but nonetheless, it's an assumption that makes this model work. Then, effects of any transaction costs, taxes are assumed to be immaterial, as if they don't exist. So, if investor plan for the same single holding period, all investors, still we assume that the CAPM will hold, it will not severely limit the applicability of CAPM, then investors have homogeneous expectations or beliefs, a questionable assumption, but nonetheless that is needed. Uh, assets valuations are identical and uh, same optimal portfolio of risky assets is generated, so the market portfolios are the same. The next assumption is all investments are infinitely divisible. Investors can hold fractions of assets and then investors are price takers mean no one or not a single investor can influence the prices by their trades. Okay, here we go. This is your security market line. First, we discussed the capital allocation line. That is the combination of risk-free asset and the risky portfolio. Then the capital market line. And then we have the security market line. So, here we have representation of Kappen with beta, beta reflecting the systematic risk. Similar to the capital market line, the y-intercept represents RF and the slope of this line is the market risk premium. So please note in the capital allocation line and the capital market line, we had the total risk that is the standard deviation portfolio on the x-axis, but here we have the systematic risk of the asset on the x-axis. So let's let us draw the CAPM. We know y is equal to a plus bx. That's the linear function, linear equation. On y we have expected return on the asset. A represents the risk-free rate. That's the y-intercept here. X here is the beta. And now we need to calculate the gradient. Now how do we do that? This is the market risk pre uh, market portfolio here with the beta one. So, we know how to calculate the gradient, the slope, y2 minus y1, which is going to be ERM, return on the market, minus risk-free rate, upon x2 minus x1, that is 1 minus 0, so that's just 1. So, this is the, the slope or the gradient, that is RM minus RF, or the ERM expected return on the market minus risk-free rate. So, if you plug in these here, RM minus RF, you get what you call the equation of capital asset pricing model, return expected return on the asset is equal to risk-free rate plus beta times expected return on the market minus risk-free rate. Okay, so this is it. This is your function, the formula, formulation of the security market line, the capital asset pricing model. And then some further on SMN and, and CML. CML only applies to portfolios on the efficient frontier, whereas the security market line applies to any security, whether it is efficient or it is not. Next, LOS says uh, calculate and interpret the expected return of an asset using CAPM. This is the information given. Calculate expected return for a security given the risk rate is 5%. Standard deviation of security is 40%, security correlation 0.8, standard deviation 20, RM10. So, this will help us calculate the beta. Let us first calculate the beta. It is equal to correlation coefficient, that is 0.8, times 
standard deviation of the asset that is 40 percent or 0.4 and in the denominator we have the standard deviation of the market that is 20 percent 0.2 so if you simplify that will be 1.6 now apply capm expected return is equal to risk free rate plus beta and the return on the market minus risk free rate so let's plug in the numbers risk free rate being 5% beta 1.6 the return on the market 10% and the risk free rate is 5% if you do the simplification the expected return 13% so so computation is fairly straightforward next we have describe and demonstrate application of capm and the sml and uh, calculate and interpret sharp ratio trainer ratio m squared and the jensen's alpha i've combined these two lss and uh, these are the areas covered in these two lss uh, performance evaluation security selection portfolio construction and limitation of capm and now we will discuss these one by one first performance evaluation and then within performance evaluation we will do sharp ratio trainer's ratio m squared ratio and jensen's alpha so let us first start performance evaluation the first category and within this the sharp ratio sharp ratio is given by this formula and i'm very sure you would remember this from your uh, quants reading we discussed there uh, this uh, concept in detail uh, just a quick overview what is sharp ratio it is rp minus rf that is the risk premium divided by the portfolio risk so the point to remember here the portfolio with the highest sharp ratio has the best performance then we have the trainers ratio this ratio as you can see is somewhat similar to the sharp ratio but it only consider the systematic risk but it as you can see beta could be negative and positive so this ratio would not work for the assets with negative betas that move in the opposite direction to the market returns then we have m squared ratio and jensen's alpha that is the fourth one this is the formula for you need to memorize this formula this is the formula to calculate m squared ratio uh, what does it show us a portfolio that matches the return of the market will have m squared equal to 0 while a portfolio that outperforms will have a positive value and the portfolio that is underperforming the then the market will have a negative so this is again uh, a performance evaluation criterion m squared then we have last one the jensen's alpha jensen alpha is given by this formula if a p is equal to rp minus rf plus beta the portfolio rm minus rf now if the result of this formula is positive the portfolio has outperformed the market whereas if the result is negative then that would indicate underperformance alpha can be used to rank the portfolios or we can use alpha to set what is the maximum an investor should pay for the active management of that portfolio then we have uh, next area security selection okay now if an asset is correctly priced it has to be on this security market line those assets that are undervalued they will be below the security market line and the assets that are undervalued they will be above the security market line so overvalued they are good sell and the undervalued they are good buy that is the application of the cap and then we have certain other elements as well portfolio construction now securities with the with the positive alpha relative to the market index should be included in the portfolio and securities with the negative alpha relative to the index should be excluded and those securities that have a higher alpha they should be given more weights in the portfolio because they are expected to perform better right then finally some limitations of the capital asset pricing model 
first limitation is that the true market portfolio includes all assets both financial and non-financial which may not be investable so that is one of the limitations there are many other assets that are not investable but they're not covered under the capm then different analysts they may use different proxies for the market portfolio that is the deviation from capm beta which is a measure of systematic risk beta estimation requires a long history of returns which may not always be available and also history is not a perfect predictor of the future outcomes and finally investors are unlikely to have homogeneous expectations there will be many optimally risky portfolios and numerous security market lines so we can't assume there were many uh, oversimplified assumptions in the uh, in the capm model so the, all those assumptions basically are the limitations so we can challenge we can bring on all these as the limitation of capm model so that ends your uh, reading portfolio risk and return part 2